So, very good morning, Professor Becker. It is such a wonderful experience to have you, hear you, and listen to your thoughts on second S.K. Chakraborty Memorial Lecture on Human Values and Ethics in Organizations. The topic that you have chosen, the human values of meekness in servant leader and transformational leadership is unique. It's unique. So we have with us Dr. J.L. Raina, who has joined. So Dr. Raina, you may like to welcome the speaker, Professor Kony Becker. Is having some network problem, it seems. Uh, I request Mr. Amresh Ray to introduce the speaker, please. Sure, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for the opportunity. Uh, I really feel uh, blessed and honored to uh, introduce our distinguished uh, speaker uh, for the second lecture of uh, Professor S.K. Chakravarti uh, Memorial Lecture Series on Human Values and Ethics in Organization. And today we are privileged to have uh, Dr. Cornel Baker, uh, an eminent scholar, a scholar, a beacon in the field of biblical studies and leadership. Dr. Cornel joined Regent University in 2005. He previously served as the Associate Dean for Academics for Raima Bible College in Johannesburg, South Africa, as a professor of biblical and ecclesial leadership for the School of Business and Leadership, as well as the Chair of Department of Biblical Studies and Christian Ministry at the College of Arts and Sciences. He was appointed Dean of the School of Divinity at Regent University in December 2015. He is the 2010 recipient of the Chancellor's Award at Regent University for the Outstanding Scholarship, Teaching and Service. He has also served as an extraordinary professor for the Research Unit for Reformed Theology at the Northwest University in South Africa. He holds a Doctorate of Literature and Philosophy in Biblical Studies from the Rand Afrikaans University in Johannesburg, South Africa. His research interests are in the Gospel of Matthew, Biblical perspectives in leadership, and Biblical hermeneutics. He describes himself as a sinner saved by grace, a follower of Christ, a husband, and a father. Today, he graces us with his expertise to delve into the intriguing topic of the human value of meekness in servant and transformational leadership. And I'm sure that we all of us uh, will be enlightened by his in insights and he will inspire all of us in our exploration of human values and ethics in organization. Uh, with this, I request you to uh, deliver your lecture, sir. Thank you. thank you so much. Mr. Ray, thank you for that very kind introduction. Dear colleagues, what a joy it is to join you today on two different continents. And I'm sure there are other folks listening as well. I want to express my specific gratitude to Dr. Singh Singh Gupta. Um, I had the privilege of meeting Dr. Singh Gupta more than a decade ago. And I remember <clears throat> she invited um, a, a number of us to participate in um, what in my mind was one of the first um, cross-cultural, cross-religious interfaith um, conferences on the integration of spirituality and organizational leadership. And I was astounded not only to watch Dr. Singh Gupta's incredible organizational giftings, but also the fact that everything she does is marked by a beautiful, beautiful leadership aesthetic. And secondly, with just extraordinary grace. Over the last decade, I've had great opportunities to watch Dr. Singh Gupta in action. And again, every single time she does anything, there's such beauty connected with it and grace. I feel today so privileged to be here because I think that I am indeed a student of Dr. Singh Singh Gupta and indeed a student of all of you. Thank you for the privilege of sharing a short reflection today. Thank you, Dr. Thank Sing, you. Singh Gupta. Thank you. Thank gonna, you. Yeah, great. I'm going to go ahead and share some slides, and then I'll introduce the topic at hand. Let me go and do that. Great. 
I'm so grateful for the fact that we have technology that can connect all of us across the world so that we might be able to reflect together and learn together. So the title of my presentation is The Human Value of Meekness in Servant and Transformational Leadership. Organizational leadership is a difficult field to study. It is also a difficult field to advance. And I think one of the reasons for that is that firstly, leadership is somewhat of a tricky and slippery construct. It is much easier to speak about uh, dysfunctional leadership and leadership that has injured people than to explore what good and healthy and human-based leadership could look like. The second problem in organizational leadership is that the origins of the discipline is not exactly focused on human values. Scholars have marked that the beginning of organizational leadership came out of the industrial age, where initially the question was, how could we persuade workers and laborers to work as hard as they can for as little profit as possible? The extraordinary thing, however, is that organizational leadership did not start there. And even though the first beginnings of theories were somewhat dysfunctional, if you think of, for instance, great man theory, the question is, what makes for a great leader? And initially, these were all either physical attributes of strength and height and, and handsomeness um, or um, uh, organizational leaders such as strength and courage um, Organizational leadership didn't stay there. Organizational leadership, and this is an extraordinary thing, started to explore, could there be different ways in leading, not only within national and pol political spheres, but specifically in business and economic context as well. The last number of years, we have seen the rise of a destructive form of leadership. Jean Lippen Blumen, who is one of the founding theorists in organizational leadership here in the United States, in 2005 wrote what is considered as the foundational text on uh, destructive leadership. And she called this the allure of toxic leaders. Blumen describes a toxic leader in the following ways. She says, their leadership leaves their followers worse off than they found them, often violating the basic human right of others and playing to their followers' basest fears. Then she goes on, she says, first, toxic leaders engage in seriously destructive behaviors. And secondly, they exhibit dysfunctional personal qualities. She goes on, together their actions and character concoct a deadly brew of significant and sustained injury. And I'm sure that if we could go around this virtual room today, every single one of us would have a personal anecdote or a story of a time that we were in an organization and got injured. Samito et al. in a recent article on defining toxic leadership describes it in the following way. They write, toxic leadership is a kind of maladjusted, malcontent, and malevolent, malevolent leadership by which an individual, by virtue of his or her destructive behavior and his dysfunctional characteristics, inflicts serious and enduring harm on the individuals, groups, organizations, and communities. The question is for us today. Is there a different way? That's the question. The extraordinary truth is that although organizational leadership is fairly new as an academic discipline, the construct of leadership is much older. The construct of good and virtuous leadership is as old as human civilization. And there are extraordinary examples in history 
and within the cultural and religious traditions of many cultures of leaders that did this differently. Three examples that I would like to offer today of people and leaders that acted in ways that are radically different than the described toxic leadership that we've seen described by Semedo et al., as well as John Lipman Blumen. And the three examples that I would like to raise here is that of the Jewish leader, Moses, the Christian leader, Jesus of Nazareth, and here particularly, the extraordinary example of the Indian spiritual and political leader, Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhians often refer to with regard to his leadership as that of being meek. Gandhi drove change through nonviolent actions, selfless intentions, and principled beliefs. His deeply centered and humble leadership style inspired widespread change across the world. He's often credited as having a profound influence on future leaders and meek leaders, such as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., President Nelson Mandela, and Aung San Suu Kyi. Now, today, what I would like to do for a moment is introduce a counter value in organizational leadership to that of toxic leadership. Where did this idea came from? In 2003, we find the first academic article on the human value of meekness in leadership. David Molyneux in 2003 in the Journal of Business Ethics wrote an article that he entitled, Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. And with a subtitle, an aspiration applicable to business. In this article, Molyneux made three proposals. Firstly, he marked that contemporary research in productive, effective leadership, such as by um, the very well-known popular press book of Collins, has identified meekness as a personal quality for the highest level leadership at great businesses. He also remarked that this theme of meekness and leadership is identifiable also in religious and ancient philosophical narratives. He then goes on and define meekness in the following way. He says, meekness is not about powers foregone. And let me just stop here for a moment. Meekness is a difficult construct to describe and often largely understood by people. Often people think of meekness or a meek person as somebody that is weak, unable to act, or somebody that has been robbed of their powers. But Molyneux says that meekness is not about powers foregone, but powers controlled and exercised with discernment. He then continues on and he describes meekness as a spiritual value, value. And he says that this meekness transcends individual and organizational purposes, being aspirational for any activities that involve providing services and for being accountable. It is this line that started my own avenue of research in the possibility of practicing meekness in organizational leadership. If we think of human orientated forms of leadership, such as transformational and servant leadership, it is all about serving the follower and being accountable for our actions. Molyneux proposes that meekness might be the lost human and spiritual value that we need to empower servant and transformational leadership. And this is really what set off my own research in this area. Then as I started to look at the virtue of meekness, I discovered that it, this particular value is mentioned fairly early in Western and other religious traditions. The Greek philosopher Plato, in describing the perfect human society in a text called the Republic, describes the best kind of civic leader in the following ways. 
And if you listen closely, you will see that this description matches our understanding of meekness. He says, the intents of their hearts were true and in all ways noble, and they showed balanced, accountable, kindly self-control joined with discernment. That is the description of meekness. Kindly self-control joined with discernment in dealing with the changes and changes of life and their dealings with one another. It's these two constructs that really uh, got a hold of my own um, quest to understand what a virtuous-based approach in leadership could look like. This idea of kindness in leadership and this idea was self-controlled. Colin Smith, in a recent article in which he describes what meekness looks like in the transformation of a leader, describes it in the following way. He says, meekness is like the taming of a wild horse. Man is by nature a wild creature with a short temper, impatient and self-opinionated. Without meekness, we slide into an internal conflict of soul that manifests itself in anger, frustration, bitterness, resentment, and turmoil. Colleagues, when I listen to what Smith says, about what happens to human persons without meekness, I think we can describe often the destructive behaviors of world leaders. He goes on and he says, meekness tames the temper. The moment that I read that, it got me pretty um, positive about the possibilities of how meekness could be employed in the transformation of toxic and dysfunctional leaders. He goes on, meekness tames the temper, subdues the self, calms the passions, and brings order out of chaos in the soul. Meekness calms, soothes, and subdues. One of my own questions in my quest to understand a virtuous-based and human-based form of leadership is whether dysfunctional leaders could be transformed. I believe that the adoption of the human value of meekness can help leaders be transformed. In essence, take these wild horses and tame them. So today, um, I'm going to structure my presentation in three, um, not so large blocks, but at least three sections. Firstly, I would like to speak from my own religious and cultural traditions, in essence, conducting what I call theological and spiritual retrieval in history. And I'm going to speak about a classical and Judeo-Christian theology of meekness. Colleagues, let me be clear as I speak about my own theological uh, context and history. I am not proposing today that Judeo-Christian theology or context or cultural history have the monopoly on meekness. Of course not. I believe that this human value is found in all cultures and probably in all religious and ancient philosophical traditions. But I can only speak about what I know. And so I hope at the end of this presentation to hear from you so that I can be enlightened in the wisdom and insight that comes from other religious and philosophical traditions. But I'm going to speak from my own context. Secondly, I want to spend some time in our quest to define what meekness looks like in leadership. Yeah, I want to build on really groundbreaking work that was done in 2015 by a scholar by the name of Lehel Caesar, who looked at the Jewish leader of Moses as an example of meek leadership. And then thirdly, this is really the heart of my presentation today, I would love to discuss the implications of the adoption of the human value of meekness in leadership theory and praxis. 
All right. So let's start with a classical and Judeo-Christian theology of meekness. And here the question is, what can we learn from um, uh, this particular uh, or these particular theological and cultural traditions? In the Christian scriptures, the earliest letter that occurs is a letter written by a Jewish leader by the name of James to a congregation in Jerusalem in Israel. And in this letter, he describes what Christian leaders should act like. And he asks this um, extraordinary question. And he says, who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. This is the oldest Christian text that we have. And already in this text, there is a quest to define what healthy, human-based, virtue-based leadership could look like. And in essence, he is asking this provocative question, if they are leaders who think that they are wise, well, then make sure that their leadership actions are moderated and modulated by weakness, because weakness shows indeed wisdom. This construct of meekness is difficult to define. The Greek word that is used in both the Christian New Testament and in the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, the Septuagint makes use of a particular Greek word to describe meekness. The word is proutus, and proutus describes a condition of mind and heart, an internal attitude, whereas gentleness, this is mildness combined with tenderness, refers to actions and external behavior. Although English has no direct equivalent words to this Greek word proutes, meekness comes to mind. Now, here's the interesting thing. According to numerous sources, the word that is used here in Greek proutes, historically in the first century of the common era, was associated with the breaking in of horses. Wild stallions were captured in the mountains and brought down to be broken and trained, for a variety of uses. It was imperative, however, that the horses retained their spirit, courage, and power, but without discipline and total obedience, these traits were useless. And what's extraordinary here, within the etymological study of this word proutes, we find this idea that leaders could be transformed, that their spirit, courage, and power could be modulated and shaped so that they could lead others with wisdom and grace and indeed gentleness. Walter Elman, in a 1996 study on the word proutus, describes it in the following way. He says, late 20th century Western culture does not hold meekness to be a virtue. In contrast to the ancient Near East and the Greek and Roman world, which placed a high premium on it and this is important to understand and i th and he goes on he says the reason for this is that people largely uh, think of meekness in a pejorative sense because they think that meekness is weakness or effeminate or associated um, with being without power however that's not really what meekness means he then concludes his study on what meekness could be by saying meekness is therefore an active and deliberate acceptance of undesirable circumstances that are wisely seen by the individual as only part of a larger picture. Uh, Mark E. Kanan in 2010 um, wrote another extraordinary article in his quest to define what meekness might be. And he says, in the Judeo-Christian traditions, a spiritually meek person is not self-willed, not continually concerned with his own ways, ideas, or wishes. These meek people are people that control their strength. They are willing to put themselves in second place and submit themselves to achieve what is good for others. He says, meekness is therefore the antithesis of self-will, self-interest, and self-assertiveness. 
And here again, he marks something that we've noticed in almost all the literature. He says, this is a sign not of weakness, of character, but of strength. When all of the sources that explores meekness in the Judeo-Christian traditions are examined, it is clear to me that meekness is described in these traditions by two particular understandings. Firstly, meekness is the control of our own self-estimation, a refusal to make ourselves bigger than what we are, a refusal to inflate our own self-estimation, and secondly, a reticence to assert ourselves for the sake of ourselves. What is meekness? Control of strength. What is meekness? A discernment of when to act and when not to act, marked by gentleness. In the Christian tradition, there are two, well, excuse me, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, there are two particular figures that are described um, uh, as extraordinarily meek. There's a third one that we will look at later. The three, of course, are Moses, King David, and Jesus. Moses, uh, I will come back to in just a tiny little bit, but let me share with you um, wisdom that came from the Jewish King David. In a psalm that he wrote, and a psalm in the Judeo-Christian tradition, is a devotional or spiritual poem or song. And in a psalm that he wrote, Psalms 37, David is going through a very difficult time as a king with all kinds of turmoil in the land and also of enemies within the kingdom and outside. And in the psalm, he reflects on what must he do with his enemies? What must he do with people that oppose him? What must he do with people that intentionally seek his harm? And in the psalm, he reflects, and in the climax of the song, he's, he says this. He says, but the meek shall inherit the land. I want to just stop here and say to you that this is a provocative piece of human wisdom. Because typically in human history, it's not the meek that gets the land. It's typically those that are powerful, the ones that make use of violence, and the ones that force their thoughts and opinions upon themselves or uh, upon others that get the power, the prestige, the privilege, and the land. But David reflects and say, no, there is a different way. He said, it is the meek, those who control their strength, that will gain ground. And not only this, they will delight themselves in abundant peace. I have to say that this wisdom is countercultural today. Here in the United States, we are inundated with narratives and all kinds of acclaims that it's the powerful, the forceful um, that get their way these are the people that advance within the world. When we look at the extraordinary difficult situations around the world, whether that be in the Ukraine or in Russia or in uh, Tibet and China and Taiwan or in Israel and Palestine today, we are inundated with this narrative that in order to go forward, you must use um, emotional, physical, intellectual force. But David says there is a different way. He says the big shall inherit the land. And not only does he say that, but he says they will be blessed with abundant peace. In the Christian tradition, Jesus of Nazareth follows this example. And in the Gospel of Matthew, a gospel written to a Jewish audience, and a gospel is simply a narrative of a life that has the intent to proclaim wisdom, it is recorded that Jesus in his first large sermon, a sermon called the Sermon on the Mount, said the following. He opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, 
Blessed are those who know their own poverty within, their own humility, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And here, Jesus of Nazareth quotes the wisdom of King David. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek. Later on in the same gospel, Jesus speaks to his followers and in an invitation for organizational unity and for his followers to be joined with him in mission. Listen to what he says. He says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle the Greek word here is proutus, the word that we've just described before, that describes meekness. And I'm lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It is, a, a, again, an extraordinary countercultural message of a leader today. I'm not sure if we could find a leader that would say, if you come and work for me, you will find out that I'm humble and lowly of heart and you might find rest for your souls. Um, what a provocative idea. So in the Judeo-Christian traditions, meekness speaks about a control of strength a certain lowliness of heart, a certain gentleness in dealing with other people, a discernment of how to use the power, the prestige, and the privilege that comes with leadership. It also proposes that those who follow meek leaders will not only themselves gain ground, but be blessed with peace and substantial inner rest. Now, how do we define meekness in leadership? Colleagues, I could probably spend seven or eight hours looking at examples of meek leaders in the history of our world, but for the sake of brevity today, I only want to look at one example, and this is Moses. Now, before we do that, let me just once again try to describe meekness in a more robust way. Matthew Henry, a Christian theologian and theorist, describes meekness as a human value. And he says, meekness is an attribute of human nature and behavior that has been defined as an amalgam of righteousness, inner humility, and patience. Meekness has been contrasted with humility alone in so much as humility simply refers to an attitude towards oneself, as a restraining of one's power so as to allow room for others, whereas meekness refers to the treatment of others. Maybe another way to think of the difference between meekness and humility, humility is marked by an inner attitude where meekness is active humility in how do we treat others. In a groundbreaking article written by Lyell Caesar in the Journal of Adventist Theology in 2015, the theorist Caesar looks at Moses particularly as a meek leader. And she describes uh, Moses as an important figure for us in the following ways. She says, among history's preeminent leaders, secular or religious, ecclesiastical or political, social and practical, or theoretical intellectual, ancient Israel's slave-born son Moses occupies the rarest of rare ground. He stands perhaps without equal in his witness to the value and practice of great leadership, so transcending in his time, so compellingly impacting the millennia since his birth, that he is now freely acknowledged as the human fountainhead of three great world religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, the scriptures refer to Moses as meek here. 
Um, in the book of Numbers from the Hebrew Scriptures, it says the following. Now, the man Moses was very meek, more than all the people who were on the face of the earth. It is the one descriptor of Moses that stands out above any else. So now the question is, what can we learn from the history of Moses? A quick overview of who Moses was. Moses was born amongst the Jewish people as a Jewish man. At this time, the Jewish people, by this time known as the children of Israel, lived in Egypt and were enslaved by Pharaoh and Egyptian culture. He was born amongst slaves, the poorest of the poor, people with no privilege, no power, no prestige. During that time, Pharaoh became deeply concerned that this people group were growing too quickly and so decided to kill most of the Jewish children. His mother, in an act to save him, put him in a tiny little basket on a river and um, released him so that the daughter of Pharaoh would find this baby in a basket on the river. And the narrative goes that he is then found by the daughter of Pharaoh, raised as a son of Pharaoh, but that at the age of 40, seeing the destruction of his own people, he acted not in a very meek manner, but in an aggressive manner and killed an Egyptian and fleed Egypt. But the next 40 years, Moses would live amongst Bedouin tribes in the Sinai. And this is where for 40 years, this figure Moses is transformed from a willful, arrogant, violent leader to that of a meek person. And at the end of that 40 years, he has an encounter with the divine and he's sent back to Egypt to liberate his people who after this liberation, he would lead back to their ancestral lands through a 40-year journey in the desert. Now, the question is, what are the attributes of Moses' meek leadership? The hell season, I would encourage you to look at this article. It's an extraordinary article. Identifies five attributes of Moses' meek leadership. And it's these attributes that I would say could be the most helpful for us in thinking about what meekness could do in our human orientated and transformative ways of leadership. Caesar proposes that Moses was a teachable leader, that he was open-minded, mission-focused, that yet he was firmed, and ultimately that he shared leadership with his followers. I'm going to say just a few things about all five of these attributes, and then I would like to conclude this conversation by thinking about what does this mean for our theories and praxis in organizational leadership. Firstly, Moses was teachable. Moses's transformation happens in the midst of leaving Egypt having grown up in the richest family with the most possible power, comfort, prestige, and privilege. And he goes into the Bedouin culture where he learns different values. He marries the son of, a excuse me, the daughter of a Bedouin leader by the name of Jethro. And Moses learns from this Bedouin leader how to lead in a different way. Meek leaders are teachable. They come into an organization with their minds and their hearts open to learn from their followers and from the context. I have met so many meek leaders that um, have across cultures and across philosophical and religious traditions have been open to learn from other traditions and other wisdoms so that their leadership could be better. 
There's nothing more destructive than a leader that steps into an organization with a know-all attitude. Meek leaders are teachable. Moses was also open-minded. Throughout his tenure in leadership, he carefully considers every situation and he's not fixed in his mind, unmovable. I think all of us have experienced destructive leadership when you try to explain to a leader why his or her decisions might not be the best for the organization. There is nothing more destructive than a leader that is unwilling to consider the wisdom of others. Carl Denny, in an extraordinary article on meekness and leadership, writes, he says that meekness grow alongside humility and wisdom in that it seeks another person's interest at the expense of its own. And this kind of meekness, he says, is pure, peaceable, gentle. And here's the one that I really want to emphasize, open to reason. Meek leaders are not only teachable, but they're flexible. And they're willing to consider the larger context and learn from others. Thirdly, Caesar says that true meek leaders control their strength, always choosing to rather focus on the mission than their own preferences and desires. What makes them so controlled, what makes them so effective is that they are mission focused. Arshi Sproul, a Christian theologian who recently passed away in 2018, wrote an article on the value of meekness, this ability to control one's strength. And he said, our world is full of turmoil and we add our own inner turmoil to it. He says, but meekness brings a quiet, a composure of the soul that stills our turmoil. It brings clarity and purpose because it's a victory over ourselves. He says, that is why meekness brings true courage. That is the will and ability to act selflessly in sacrificial ways. Meek leaders are teachable, open-minded, and mission-focused. But let me also say, Caesar proposes and offers this particular wisdom that meek leaders are not weak. They are able to stand firmly even in the midst of extraordinary adversity and difficulty in their leadership. And in the life of Moses, for 40 years, he would lead the people of Israel from Egypt to their ancestral promised land. And in that context would encounter extraordinary difficulty but he remains focused. And true meek leaders can not only be mission-minded, but they are firm in their commitment to gentleness, kindness, and the humanity of others. And finally, Caesar says that true, me true meek leadership finds its highest dimension in the willingness to make space for others. The desire and the hope to elevate, train, and ultimately empower others, other followers to become leaders in their own right. Alan Fong, in a very recent article on Moses as a leader, describes it in the following way. He says, meekness is humility, perseverance, patience, and tenderness of heart all wrapped together. That description of tenderness of heart is a lost virtue in organizational leadership. When leaders are tender of heart, in the words of Jesus of Nazareth, poor in spirit, there's something extraordinary that happens to followers. They respond to that tenderness and they are able to see themselves as people that can make a difference in their own world. He goes on. Moses took criticism and stride. He endured the murmuring and constant complaining of the Israelites. Caesar writes, it is leadership that respects the people's abilities and allows them to serve in the areas of their gifts. She says this meekness 
both refreshes the larger group and preserves leaders' energies so that they may continue to share the accumulated wisdom of the years even after they have passed their command to others and retired to less demanding schedules of service. So Moses is an example of meek leadership. Caesar proposes that there are five attributes of meek leadership. Meek leaders are teachable, open-minded, mission-focused, firm, and ultimately they share their leadership. Now, I've said all of this to make a few concluding statements here. What are the implications for leadership theory and praxis? This lost virtue of gentleness, tenderness of heart, control of our strength, this attribute of meekness, how does it impact our understanding of leadership? Increasingly, over the last 10, 20, 30 years, organizational leadership has moved into a more humane orientation. Two particular theories that have taken um, at their heart this mission to transform organiza organizational leadership to include more human values and to be more humane in its orientation are the theories of transformational and servant leadership. Now, I don't want to go through all of these um, uh, theories, but I'll just quickly summarize these two theories for you. It was Bass in 1985 that initially identified transformational leadership, and he proposed a transformational leadership theory consists of four components. And he said that leaders bring transformation to organizations and their followers through idealized influence, individualized consideration, inspirational motivation, and intellectual stimulation. As you can see, it is a follower-focused approach in leadership, deeply humane in its orientation. In addition to this, the theories of servant leadership that have both on Robert Greenleaf's initial understanding that a servant leader is the leader that desires to serve others first. Theorists like Focht and Ponton um, have taken Greenleaf's ideas and have really fleshed it out into what leadership or servant leadership behaviors could look like. And they identified it as including valuing people, humility, listening, trust, caring, integrity, service, empowering, serving others' needs before their own, collaboration, love, unconditional love, and learning. What does meekness have to do with transformational and servant leadership? I am going to propose today that the human value of meekness, this tenderness of heart, this lowliness of spirit, this ability to control ourselves, this quest to be teachable, open-minded, mission-focused, firm, and yet the willingness to share power in leadership can be the fuel to, to propel servant and transformational leadership. I'm going to propose that transformational and servant leadership would do well to include this transformative value of meekness in their theories. And I would say that meekness is the inner attitude that could propel servant and transformational leadership forward. It is maybe the hidden spiritual engine, the hidden fuel of these transformative servant orientated leadership. I'm also proposing that theorists in servant and transformational leadership would do well to go back and study the deeper dimensions of meekness because it could be the missing dimension, the hidden fuel, that which propels servant and transformational leadership. In conclusion, Meekness is not weakness. Meek leaders are wise and they strong. Susie Chasm in a recent blog said, real greatness does not reside inside those who feel large. The truly wise are the meek. John Stott in a 2016 commentary on Christian scripture wrote, 
Contrary to misconceptions, meekness is not synonymous of weakness. Rather, they embodies the gentleness of the strong who exercise control over their strength. David Graber, in a 2020 text on meekness, describes the meek leader as somebody that has inner and outer strength. He says, meekness, we should understand, is not weakness. Though scoffed at by an assertive and bruising world, meekness demonstrates tremendous strength for its power under internal restraint. Meekness withheld force that could otherwise be brought to bear, keeping it in check for the right purpose, appropriate magnitude, and perfect time. And as I conclude, a last little bit of wisdom. From the Jewish scriptures in the book of Proverbs, there's this proverb. Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. Meekness is the human value that propels human orientated, servant focused, and transformative forms of leadership. It is the missing dimension that will make leaders wise and strong. Thank you for your time.